Okay, this morning's reading is from Romans 8, verses 1 to 17, and the Church Bible's page 800. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was, for what the law was powerless to do, in that it weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the sinful man, in order that the righteous requirements of law might be fully met in us. Who do not live in according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit? Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on that, what that is nature desires. But those who live in accordance to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of the sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the spirit. If the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not the sinful, not of the, to the sinful nature to live according to it. For you live according to the sinful nature will die. But if the spirit you put to death, the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who, lead, so those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with your own, with your, with our spirit, that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs to God, and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Well, this morning we're in uh, Romans chapter 8. And if you you have Bibles there, you could follow along with us as we uh, consider these verses. Romans 8, 1 to 17, I've entitled them A New Way of Living. A New Way of Living. Uh, at home, I have a grape vine that doesn't bear grapes. So I've come up with a neat way to ensure that my grape vine will bear grapes. This week I'm going to uh, make contact with my local MP and I'm going to ask my local MP to sponsor a private member's bill in Parliament to enact a law that will require my grapevine to produce grapes. And when that law has been enacted and it's on the statute books, I'm going to get a hard copy of it and I'm going to stand in front of my grapevine, I'm going to wave it around and say, I demand you to produce grapes. I have a law here that says you must. Yes, I see you with your head in your hands, shaking your heads in pity and sorrow that Peter has finally lost it. The pressures of the ministry has finally got to him. 
I think it's a great idea. Well, <clears throat> it won't work. <laughs> it won't work. It won't work because grapes can only be the fruit springing from the vine's own life. Unless there's some life coming from within, there will be no fruit. So I've got to figure out a way to get the life back into my grapevine if I expect to see some fruit. Well, that brings us to Romans 8, 1 to 17. Up until now, Paul has been talking about the significance of our new life in Jesus Christ. As Christians, we have been set free from the law of sin and death. In Christ, we have died to sin so that it is no longer our master. And we can now say no to sin and to temptation. We have also died to the law so it can no longer condemn us. The law's death penalty for disobedience no longer hangs over us. All of this, Paul has talked about in the last few chapters. But in all of this, Paul has had very little to say about the role of the Holy Spirit. The role of the Holy Spirit in all of this has been largely absent from all that Paul has been saying in these last few chapters. Well, all that changes here in chapter 8. This chapter is full of references to the Holy Spirit. Why do you think that is? Why is Paul now going to focus in on the Holy Spirit's work in all of this? Well, because all that Paul has been saying about our position in Christ and our ongoing obligation in Christ comes to nothing. It's meaningless. It's gobbledygook. It comes to nothing if the Holy Spirit is not present in our lives. Because only the Holy Spirit can provide us with the life within from which the fruit will come. A Christian life of love and hope and joy and holy living and quiet assurance and a non-anxious presence and the light of this world's troubles will not come from the demands of others. It will not come from the stipulations of law. A life of Love and hope and joy and holy living can only come from within as we yield to the Holy Spirit's working in our hearts. So, that's where Paul is going to take us here in chapter 8. What it means to be alive in the Holy Spirit for a new way of living. Verse 1 of chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Note the word now there in that verse. Bringing that uh, promise into the present tense. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. As we come to the end of chapter 7, this is exactly the word that we need to hear at the end of chapter 7, we have been told about the intense struggle we all go through as believers, even the great Apostle Paul, the struggle with remaining sin and temptation in our lives. And this struggle can drive us to despair and to discouragement, or it can drive us to grit our teeth and make greater efforts to do the right thing. And in all of that struggle, the cry of chapter 7, verse 24 goes up, Who will rescue us from this predicament? Who will rescue us from this struggle and from this tension? And the answer is that Christ will rescue us from this body of sin when we are resurrected with a new and glorious body. But while we wait and hope and while we struggle, while we wait for that rescue from this body of sin, 
In the meantime, there is now no condemnation. In the meantime, while we wait and while we struggle, we have this assurance that there is now no condemnation. Why is that? Because we have already died with Christ and we have already been resurrected with Christ. We are alive because he is alive. We are united to him. We will not be condemned because he will not be condemned. Could you imagine Jesus Christ being condemned by God on that final day of judgment? Well, no, of course not. Well, for the very same reason, we can't imagine a believer being condemned on that final day of judgment because that believer is united to Jesus Christ. We will not be condemned because he will not be condemned. The condemnation spoken of here in chapter 8 verse 1 is the condemnation of a last day's judgment against sin. There's no escaping that last day judgment against sin. We may be able to avoid in this life the consequences of our sin. We may be able to deny it or hide it or brush it to one side, but ultimately it will be faced before God's judgment throne. And God's condemnation against sin is a condemnation to an eternal punishment in hell. But for those united to Christ by faith, the verdict has been brought forward. The verdict of a final day, no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, has been brought forward and applied to us now, has been applied to us today. We don't have to wait for judgment day to know what our fate will be. Any one of us at any time faces the possibility of imminent death and of passing into eternity. My friends, we do not need to live one more day without that assurance. When you pass into eternity and stand before God, will he pronounce over you no condemnation? And if the best that you can say this morning is, well, I hope so, then my friends, there is no assurance here for you in Romans 8 chapter 1. The assurance is that there is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. If you are united to Jesus by faith, trusting him to forgive your sins, then your assurance is that you don't need to live one more day without that confidence that when that time comes, there will be no condemnation awaiting you. The verdict has been brought forward and applied to us now. We don't have to wait Till then, to hear what it is. Do you have that assurance today? Do you have that assurance today that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus? Verse 2. Verse 2 begins because. Here is the reason there is no condemnation. Because through Jesus Christ, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life. This is the life-giving Holy Spirit. In verse 9, this Holy Spirit is referred to as the spirit of Christ, and it's referred to as the spirit of God. It's the third person of the Trinity that imparts life. It's the one who brings life to those who are dead in trespasses and sins. It is he who rescues us from the law of sin and death. This immutable law of sin and death condemns all those not covered by the blood of Christ. This is the law that we've been rescued from because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. What is this law of the spirit of life? We've heard much in the last few chapters about the law of sin and death. What is this law of the spirit of life? We haven't heard this before in the book of Romans. What is this law of the spirit of life? It's a law that says that you are no longer dead but alive by the power of God's spirit living in you. 
It's a law that says if God's spirit is living in you, you are alive and you are not dead. You are spiritually alive. You are alive to a spiritual life. And as a result, there is no condemnation. Verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit. For what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature. If my grapevine is dead... No amount of law is going to bring life. The law would be powerless in the face of a dead grapevine. The law is powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature. The law of God is holy, righteous and good, but it's unable to impart life to us. It's unable to give us life since our sinful nature ensured that we could never obey God's law perfectly. So God sent his son on the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering for us. And so our sinful nature was put to death. And now the righteous requirements of God's law are fully met in us since we are united to the righteousness of Jesus. Look at verse 4 again. in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. That's the done deal. The righteous requirements of the law have been fully met in us, not because we have obeyed, but because Jesus, Jesus who has fulfilled all the righteous requirements of the law, has linked his righteousness to us. It's a done deal. That's our justification where the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. But then the verse goes on to say, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. You see, it's both a done deal and it's a daily requirement. It's a done deal in that the righteousness of Christ has been given to us. That's our justification. But it's a daily requirement that we continue to live not according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Verse 5. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what the nature, that nature desires. From verses 5 to 8, the word mind is mentioned five times. The mind here is not so much a reference to the brain, but to the inner person, to the heart, the wellspring of life. Remember that reading we had in Mark 7, where Jesus said that from the heart comes all those wicked things, from the heart comes all those things of the sinful nature. We're here in verse 5, uh, Paul is telling us that those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds or their, the inner person, the heart, the soul set on what the nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. So to live according to one's sinful nature is to live with unregenerate hearts, hearts that are set on the sin of this world and that cannot please God, is hostile to God and headed only for death. But by contrast, those who are alive with the Spirit of life, the indwelling Holy Spirit, have their hearts set on the things of God. Do you wake up in the morning with your heart and mind set on pleasing God? That's evidence of the Holy Spirit alive and active within you. That our hearts, our minds are set on pleasing God and not pleasing ourselves. Verse 9. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. If the Spirit of God is living within you, there is no condemnation. 
Because if the Spirit of God and of Christ lives in you, then you are a child of God, and you bear the new life of the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit does not live in you, then you do not belong to God, and you are still dead in your sins. You see, that what, this is what marks a Christian out from a non-Christian. A Christian is someone who has gone from death to life, from darkness to light. And the only way that that transition can take place is if the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts and brings light where there was darkness, brings life where there was death. So you see, if, if we don't have the Holy Spirit, then that transformation hasn't taken place. If that transformation has taken place, then it's because the Holy Spirit lives within us. And because the Holy Spirit lives within us, there is no condemnation. Verse 12. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. There's an obligation here. There's a responsibility those who have been made alive by the indwelling Spirit have an obligation. Have an obligation, it says there, to live by and be led by the Spirit of God. It's an obligation for which we must take responsibility. We must take responsibility for our desires, our thoughts, our attitudes, our emotions and our behaviours. And we must ask ourselves where they need to be changed in order to conform to the spirit of holiness. Only then can we bear the fruit of the spirit and be a people with a growing spiritual life. Why is it, do you think, that for so many Christians there is so little evidence of spiritual life? So little evidence of desire to get to know Christ better every day. So little evidence of a desire to be involved in serving and loving, so little desire to be excited about the things of God in their life, such a, uh, uh, such a, a, a readiness to get caught up in the things of this world and the things that satisfy the self. Why is that? Well, perhaps from verse 12, it's because we have ignored our obligation not to live according to the sinful nature, but to live according to the spiritual nature. We must be a people with a growing spiritual life, with growing evidence of spirituality, that we aren't living lives that are held captive by this world, but we are living distinctively spiritual lives. We are growing in our love and our joy and our hope. We are not stuck, as it were, in our Christian lives where we were five years ago or ten years ago or twenty years ago with whatever spiritual experience we enjoyed back then. You see, if the Spirit is in us, the Spirit is alive and the Spirit is seeking to generate spiritual life within us and we have an obligation to live according to the impulse of our spiritual life. This is what it means to live spiritually or by the Spirit or in step with the Spirit. The spiritual life is not the old sinful nature trying to reform itself. It's a new nature, a new heart within, a new spiritual person coming alive to a whole new way of living life. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are those who are putting sin to death. Look at verse, uh, the end of verse 13. Verse 13, For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Notice that verse 14 begins with the word because. Here is the evidence you see that you are led by the Spirit of God. Here is the evidence that you are a son or a daughter of God because you are putting to death the misdeeds of the body, because you are consciously separating yourself from the sins of the sinful nature. You see, and, and as we consciously separate ourselves from the sins of the sinful nature, we are giving evidence and testimony that we are led by the Spirit of God. 
There's another way of saying that. Say it the other way around. How can I be sure that I'm being led by the Spirit of God? I see people out there who claim to be led by the Spirit of God and they're having all kinds of uh, sporadic experiences and testifying to emotional highs as they're led by the Spirit of God. And then I look in, in chapter 8 of Romans verses 13 and 14 and I see there that evidence that I'm led by the Spirit of God is that I'm putting to death the misdeeds of the body. In other words, I'm dealing with the sin in my heart and life. I'm dealing with the sin in my heart and life. That's how I experience the reality of the Holy Spirit. That's how I experience the reality of the spiritual life. That's how I experience the reality of the Holy Spirit living within me. Because I'm dealing seriously with the sin in my life, the sin that would blunt the Holy Spirit testimony. Well, that's a hard thing to do, isn't it? It's a hard thing to think about our indwelling sin and what we can do about it. It's much easier just to get on and live our life and do the next thing that's on our, um, on our timetable for the coming week. We wake up each day and there's a day's activities and responsibilities there before us. And, and it's so easy just to jump into all of that and that becomes the sum total of our life, really fulfilling our responsibilities to ourselves, to our families, to other people. And, and, and this whole idea of dealing with the sin in my life, well, it just never really catches. It really never takes hold. It ne never really comes alive for me. That I can quite easily just put it to one side and, well, I don't have to think about that again until I hear another sermon on it, you see. And, and in the meantime, you see, what happens? It just kind of gets shunted to one side and, and the people around us find themselves saying, when are they ever going to change? You ever thought like that about people? Maybe you think that about yourself sometimes, but maybe we think about it by the, from the, about those around us, you see, uh, these Christians that we've known for years and, and there just seems so little change, so little evidence of spiritual life. Well, what's wrong? What's the problem? Well, we have an obligation, you see. We have an obligation to put to death. Not to live according to the sinful nature. We have an obligation to put to death the misdeeds of the body. We have that obligation because we are the sons and daughters of the living God. We have that obligation because the spirit of life has rescued us from the, from the law of sin and death. We have that obligation. Lord, I don't have what it takes to love this person. Please, will you love them through me and will you teach me what it means for me to love them as you would love them? You see what you're doing? You're acknowledging that there is a spirit within you with power and life to live the life of Jesus through you. And so we embark every day on this new adventure of living according to the Spirit of God. And we do so with the assurance there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We do it by the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. The Spirit that confirms to us every day the good news of the Gospel that we are God's children. In every day and in every circumstance, the Spirit testifies to our spirit that God is our Father and that we are His children. The Holy Spirit testifies to our human spirit, our human heart and mind, every moment of every day that God is our Father and that as His child there is now no condemnation. And so we are set free, knowing there is no condemnation, Knowing that we are children of a Father who loves us exceedingly, it sets us free, you see, to deal seriously with the sin in our heart and lives. We are his children. We are his heirs. We are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Verse 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. 
what Jesus stands to inherit on that last day, we will also inherit by grace because we too are a child of God along with Jesus. And so we willingly share his sufferings because we know that we will share his glory. The end of verse 17. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. The fellowship of his sufferings will give way to the fellowship of his glory. Now what is the fellowship of our sufferings with Christ? Here's our final point this morning. What is the fellowship of our sufferings with Christ? Well, it goes like this. Jesus suffered on account of our sins. You will not. Yes, that's right. Jesus suffered on account of our sins. We suffer on account of our sins. There's the fellowship of our sufferings with Christ. Both we and Christ suffer on account of our sins. This is the way we share in his sufferings, because we are in union with him. We suffer on account of our sins. Jesus has suffered on account of our sins. So we share those sufferings. All of that to say, you see, that, that somewhere in there, there must be in our own lives the experience of what it means to suffer on account of our sins. The people around us suffer on account of our sins. <laughs> but do we suffer on account of our sins? Do we enter into the suffering of that comes with confession and repentance and acknowledgement and seeking forgiveness? That is suffering at a real level. That's in suffering at an intense level of our hearts. We have to enter into that suffering, you see. That's how we put to death the misdeeds of the body. That's entering into the suffering of our sins. And we do that with confidence because Jesus has suffered on account of our sins and hence there is no condemnation. So we can face our sins and we can step into our sins and, 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 and seek to be reconciled with those around us and with the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's the spiritual life. That's what it means to walk with the Spirit. That what it, that's what it means to be controlled by the Spirit. He is the vine and we are the branches that bear the fruit. We are the fruit-bearing branches. The life comes from Christ within. You see, it's a new way of living where Christ indwells us by his Spirit and his Spirit floods our hearts with new life. He floods our hearts with spiritual life which is stronger than the strength of indwelling sin and frees us from sin's tyranny and enables us to glorify God in our bodies. So, we should renew our encounter with the Scriptures on a regular basis. When was the last time you, on a regular basis, spent time reading the Word of God and praying? We should renew our encounter with the Scriptures on a regular basis, and we should do all we can to develop our prayer life. And if we do that, the life within will be the fruit of the Spirit produced in us in increasing measure. And when the fruit of the Spirit is produced from within us in increasing measure, it will be there for all to see and for all to enjoy and for all to rejoice in what it means to be in fellowship with a spiritual person, one who is alive to the Spirit's working in their lives. What a joy that will be to behold. Now sanctification, you see, is progressive. We don't have to wait till glory for it all to be seen. It can begin to be seen now as we respond to the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this wonderful instruction in Romans 8 regarding the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit means in our lives for our joy and for our hope and for our holiness. And Father, as we uh, reflect on these things, we pray that you will enable us 
to make sincere and heartfelt application that we might know the joy and the thrill of your Holy Spirit at work within us with all his power and all his life-giving energy, reassuring us in our hearts again and again that there is no condemnation and that we belong to you as your children. We thank you for this glorious ministry that you have given us to be part of our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.